Hi, my name is Kirsty Sword Gushmal. You might know me perhaps as the first First Lady of Timor Leste, a position which I held from 2002 to 2007, immediately following the country's declaration of national independence in 2002. However, I am also a mother of three teenage sons and a teacher by training. I've also been called a spy by one political commentator and whilst human rights activist is a term that I prefer, must be said that I have done quite a few risky things for the cause of Timor Leste's struggle for independence over the years. And I plan to share a few of those experiences with you today. Let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to have been asked to deliver this address to you. I hope that what I have to share today will help you to view your studies in a new light and against the backdrop of some modern day challenges. I'm delighted also to share this virtual podium with my friends from Amnesty International, an organisation which I worked closely with over many years to guarantee the rights of both Indonesian and East Timorese political detainees. I'd like to get underway by sharing a little bit about myself and about Timor Leste's mammoth struggle for independence one which cost up to 250,000 lives over the course of Indonesia's illegal occupation of the territory. As a high school student in country Victoria in the 1980s, I chose to study the Indonesian language. The other language choices were French and German. To me, it made far more geographical sense to learn the language of a nation close to home. And apart from that, my father had studied Indonesian as a mature age student when I was a child. And so at the ripe age of four, I already knew how to say a few basic phrases like upper kabat, malkamana. It was through my study of language that I became involved in a practical way in Timor Leste's struggle for self-determination. As a student of modern languages at Melbourne University in the late 1980s, I came to know many um, young East Timorese dissidents who had been forced to flee their country as a result of persecution they experienced at the hands of the Indonesian authorities. Listening to their stories, I was absolutely amazed that there were such atrocities going on on Australia's doorstep and that I, for one, had never up until that moment ever heard anything about it. My conscience was pricked. I thought, this is something I need to lend my support to. I put my language skills to good use by translating human rights reports and other documents that were reaching us from the resistance movement and shared these with Amnesty International, foreign governments and others. Some years later, I found myself in Oxford in the United Kingdom working at the Refugee Studies Program at Oxford Uni. And in the middle of that year, um, I was approached by Yorkshire Television, which was planning to make a documentary film on um, socio-political developments and the human rights situation inside Timor Leste. Um, I think at that moment I was the only person with a combination of Indonesian language and Portuguese language skills and had actually visited Timor Leste before, um, who was present in the country. Um, in England at that time. So I was selected for the job. And what an exciting mission and life-changing mission that turned out to be. So in the course of that visit in 1991, the Santa Cruz massacre occurred. More than 200 civilians were killed in, that, um, in the Santa Cruz Cemetery following a peaceful procession commemorating the earlier death of a Timorese youth, Sebastián Gómez. The difference with this massacre, because there had been many previously, is that this one had been filmed by our cameraman, Max Dahl. Max had brave and bravely taken out his camera and filmed the entire massacre and very cleverly hid the video cassette under a gravestone before he was arrested afterwards. He was taken into custody and went back later to retrieve it. And that vision was seen all around the world that massacre was a turning point for Timor Leste and it was also a turning point for me personally. Up until that point, I was like many others, a member of the global solidarity movement 
However, after that experience, I decided that I actually needed to do something more concrete. I moved to Jakarta at a time when Indonesia was rapidly changing. In the early 1990s, cracks were starting to develop in the very authoritarian leadership of President Suharto, who had been in power for 30 years. And the pro-democracy movement was increasingly putting pressure on him to stand down. During this time, I was volunteering and working with Indonesian non-government organisations, which were increasingly working with internal human rights issues. One of my roles was to liaise with East Timorese political detainees inside Jakarta's high security Chibinang prison. Amnesty supported the prison prisoners with small amounts of funding to buy essential items such as medication and food. It was through this work of channeling funds and messages of support that I came to know and eventually fall in love with my future husband and leader of the East Timorese resistance, Shanana Guzman. At that time, he was serving a um, life sentence inside Chibinang Prison. <clears throat> that is, um, of course, a very long story and one that I re recounted in my book, A Woman of Independence. But let's fast forward to 1999, the year when Timor-Leste was finally able to exercise its right to self-determination. The United Nations was invited by the Indonesian government to supervise a popular consultation or referendum. And on the 30th of August that year, an overwhelming number of East Timorese voted to become an independent nation. Before the Indonesian military departed, however, <clears throat> they conducted a scorched earth campaign, torching up to 80% of public and private infrastructure, including schools and murdering innocent civilians. When the dust had settled a bit, Shanana and I arrived back in Timor-Leste to find the country in ruins and its people deeply traumatised. Traversing the country with Shanana in late 1999, I was amazed to see that makeshift schools under mango trees in the roofless shells of burnt out buildings had been re-established. I watched in awe as I watched kids walking to school in crisp white shirts to resume their education. Their homes may still have been smouldering, their new country in tatters, but for so many, returning to school, whatever that might look like, was a symbol of hope and faith in the future. As part of efforts to develop a blueprint for the country's development, very early on, Shanana led a series of popular consultations across the country. Without fail, people young and old across the country named education as their number one priority. Education is a right enshrined in the Timor-Leste Constitution and in numerous UN conventions to which Timor-Leste is a signatory. The Timorese people have a profound appreciation of the transformative power of education. 60% of the population of the country are aged 18 years and under and providing these young people with a quality education, one which equips them with 21st century skills has been an enormous challenge for the country. There are significant barriers to access to education, particularly in the rural and remote areas of the country. There are economic pressures. Family sizes are large in Timor-Leste. Most families have around five children. So whilst education is free, the costs of sending large numbers of children to school for purchasing books, uniforms, shoes, cost of um, transportation is um, quite, a, quite a, a challenge for, for many families. Um, in addition, many families, again particularly in rural areas, are subsistence farmers and they rely on um, all family members to contribute to, to labour. So often children from a young age have the terrible choice to make between helping their families to survive economically and gaining an education. In addition, there are language of instruction issues. Timor-Leste has two official languages, Tetum, which is one of 17 native languages, and Portuguese. The two languages of instruction that are recognised in schools across the country are Tetum and Portuguese. 
However, very large numbers, up to 70% of students, actually don't speak either of those languages as their first language when they enter school. So this presents tremendous challenges. Obviously, kids are unable to learn if they don't understand what is being um, taught to them in the classroom. Over the last 10 or so years, I've been agi um, agitating and um, um, advocating for the use of those mother tongues in the early years of primary education. International best practice and also evidence from numerous studies around the world um, show that kids learn better, acquire a second and a third language and an understanding of curriculum based um, subject areas better when they have a strong foundation in the language of the home. That pilot project has shown um, tremendous results and it's very encouraging to see um, that in those 10 or so pilot schools, kids are learning faster, including learning um, better and faster Tetum and Portuguese. It is, however, an ongoing battle. I guess one of the legacies of 500 years of colonial rule is that you um, end up and undervaluing your own um, culture and your own languages. So we do have um, a long way to go in terms of convincing people that is the, this is the best way um, forward in terms of uh, enabling education for all for all kids um, across Timor Leste. So if Timor Leste is to achieve the sustainable development goals, it needs to focus attention and resources on building a quality education system built on the principles of equality and access for all. It's done an amazing job of rebuilding school infrastructure and training a new generation of teachers in modern student-centred pedagogy. But there is still a great deal to do. As Goodwill Ambassador for Education in Timor-Leste since 2007, it's my duty to conclude my presentation today with a call to action. People often ask me what they can do to assist Timor-Leste in its third decade of life as an independent nation. Well, one thing you can do, and very importantly as a boost to its economy, is to visit Timor-Leste. Obviously that's not possible at the moment, but um, I would encourage all of you, as soon as you are in the headspace to plan your next overseas trip, please do some research into Timor-Leste as a destination. It has some of the most pristine marine life in the world. Um, you can go whale and dolphin watching and enjoy some of the most stunning snorkeling and diving um, in the world. You can also enjoy the tremendous hospitality of the people, listen to their stories of adversity and survival in the face of tremendous odds and tremendous challenges, experience the beauty of Timor Leste's mountains. Um, it is an absolutely stunning country. Um, I'd also invite you to bring your school and work networks into a conversation about our nearest neighbour and its ongoing development challenges, some of which I have touched upon today. Encourage your school, your place of work or local Rotary Club to get involved in efforts to support Timor Leste's education sector by raising funds or taking up a collection of school furniture or superseded ICT equipment such as laptop computers, tablets, etc. Rotary sends regular shipments of school furniture. A 40-foot container can transport 500 sets of tables and chairs. It's estimated that due to increased rates of school enrolments, 32,000 sets of tables and chairs are required in the coming years to ensure that children are not forced to sit on the ground to learn, as is presently the case in very many schools, unfortunately. It would be my pleasure to engage with you and your academic community regarding a role that you might wish to play in assisting us to rebuild Timor Leste's education sector. You can visit my website to find out more about my book, Woman of Independence, and if you would like to be in touch with me to have me speak more about my work and the country's ongoing needs. Obrigada, Barak. Thank you so much for listening to me today.